Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined from Manhattan, New York, New York by Shanif Danani. How are you doing, Shanif? I'm good, John. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, and I'm excited because uh, Shanif is a chat GPT consultant. Uh, and as we were just laughing about, like six months ago, we wouldn't be able to find somebody like that. Um, but uh, Shanif has a background in software development, data science, and he currently helps businesses understand and build systems that connect their internal and proprietary systems to chat GPT. PT enabling internal employees, customers, and other stakeholders to reap the benefits of using large language models on their own data. Uh, and you have worked with uh, you have worked with large companies like you know Twitter, Bruce Allen, and others. And what we're going to talk about today is well, we're going to talk about Chat uh, GPT. So, um, Shani, from your from your perspective. Um, what are some of the really exciting benefits of ChatGPT uh, that businesses can look forward to unlocking? Yeah, you know, it's funny you were mentioning um, what I did. It's such a mouthful, mm -hmm. but at, at its core, all that you, you know, what you're getting from ChatGPT is a lot of automation and a lot of productivity gains because now you're able to do something um, that you were never able to do before, which is sort of a bit of reasoning at the human level that allows you to really make Autom uh, automated systems do what you need them to do. This could look like anything. It could look like creating an automatic sales email for a, mm -hmm. for a prospective client. It could even look like um, taking your SaaS application and extending it with a chat interface, uh, everything in between. And so businesses are going to get a lot more pr productive um, over the next few years with ChatGPT because it can automate things that you just were never able to automate before. Yeah. And I guess the, I mean, as you know, the, there's been a lot of hype and stuff out there and people have been fearing, oh dear, like here comes AI, it's going to take over everything and I'm not going to be relevant anymore. But the reality is that so far what we've seen is if you use it intelligently, it actually becomes a way of uh, enhancing your workflow, maybe getting rid of road routine, repetitive tasks, like you said, where you can automate, but also just making it easier for you to focus on the high value activities, uh, which is where most people want to and should be. Uh, you know, th that's absolutely right. So I'll, you know, I'll give you a story. When yeah. I first started using it, I'm a software developer. I've been coding, programming for maybe 20, more than 20 years now. And I, I first used it and all of a sudden I had an oh my god moment because it wrote a whole bunch of code for me that I didn't have to think about in, a, in five seconds and I was like oh my god am I am I gonna have to worry about my job <laughs> what happened what in reality what ended up happening is over the past couple months I've used it to create code that either I didn't have time to look up or that was just mm -hmm. tedious and so it's made me more productive and so I think to your point a lot of people are worried and and, and I'm not saying it's not going to take away jobs but I think that for those folks who use it you're going to become extremely productive and you're going to be able to do a lot more things and focus on a lot more of the important things than you might have been uh, able to do before, before the tool was available. Yeah. And maybe just explain to people a little bit, because I know that some people like, uh, you know, there's chat GPT that you can get. There's the Bing one. There's one that's like a little outdated one that's more up to date. I, yeah. I think people are kind of confused about, you know, what which is the one I should be looking at right now. Uh, it feels like there's 30 different things out there you can mm -hmm. use. Um, so for most people, you're going to just go to the ChatGPT website and you're going to have this chat bot that you can use. If you're a free user, you're not paying, you're generally going to get one of their, what's called ChatGPT three and a half models or 3.5 models. This is a good model. It's basically something that works really well. It works really well. They've done a, a really good job on it. It's one of their most up-to-date models, but it's not their most up-to-date model, which is ChatGPT4. Uh, ChatGPT4 right now is available to a select group of people as well as paying customers. And it gets you a little bit of a better uh, response when you come up with harder questions. And ChatGPT4 is a little bit better at what's called reasoning. But ultimately, if you don't need something like that, then uh, 3.5, which is what you get on the website, is perfectly fine. Um, now, if you're using the API, which is what I work with a lot, you've got 20 different models to choose from. Again, 3.5 is probably the one that you're going to be working with on a day-to-day -day basis, um, but they're going to slowly improve that. They're going to give you access to ChatGPT4's API. 
Um, so there's a lot out there. I don't want to confuse people right now. Sure. Sort of the, the best and the greatest is ChatGPT mm -hmm. 4, but 3.5 is very, very good as well. Yeah. And just, um, just give us some examples of some uh, simple things that you have done either for your customers or for yourself with it so people can get an idea of maybe some use cases. Yeah, there's so many out there. So let's talk about maybe a technical use case. I mentioned yeah. it earlier. So I'm making some software for those of you who don't code, basically creating software is like typing instructions to a computer. Before I would have to think about what I want the computer to do and think really, really hard because computers are very unforgiving, have maybe like a hundred lines of code that took me maybe 20 minutes to think about and then another hour or two to fix, fix bugs on. Now I can just go to chat GPT. I can say, hey, I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to write a connection string for a database or I'm trying to do X, Y, and Z. Can you please give me the code? And it'll do it right away. And suddenly, all of a sudden, you know, I'm able to get a lot of the boilerplate stuff that I might have had to do before, mm -hmm. a lot of the tedious work out of the way. So that's one example from the tech world. Um, there's a lot of examples of salespeople who are using this to copy and paste the LinkedIn profile for a potential customer and say, mm -hmm. hey, you know, our product is this. Here's the customer I'm trying to reach. Please write me a personalized email in three sentences that will uh, optimize the chance that this person is going to get back to me. Um, so there's an example from the sales field. You've got everything, you know, in between. I've done, I've used it to, uh, to do some research as well. And I've used it to basically um, take things that I've used it to like take a website that never had right. a chat interface before and uh, add a chat interface on top of it. And now instead of having to click into web pages and going into screens, you can just ask ChatGPT, hey, you know, how many leads do I have today mm -hmm. uh, if you're looking at Salesforce? And so, you know, the, the use cases are so broad. Sure. Uh, it's one of those things where I could go on and on and on. Yeah, Most people are interested in what it can do for them, though, in their day job. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, th those were those were excellent examples. And I think the other thing that people are going to start getting used to is it's a very different way of interacting. Now, we're used to search, yeah. right? We're used to regular search, and we're used to putting in our couple of words or trying to get, yeah. you're trying to put it in a format, you know, that the that the search will react best to. It's very different, isn't it, with with uh, with yeah. Chat G, uh, GPT? Now you're kind of almost getting into a conversation with it. Yeah, it's so true. You know, when I search for something, maybe I'll type four or five of the keywords mm -hmm. that I know will result in the best uh, responses and search results. With Chat GPT, uh, you end up writing maybe a paragraph or two if it's a really complicated thing that you want it to do. You end up writing a paragraph or two. But then you save a ton of time because you no longer have to browse through five or six results. You no longer have to sort of go through a website. It gets you the exact answer you need, but you have to you have to provide it with the data and enough of a context so that it doesn't make up an answer and so that it can provide you with what you need. So you spend a little bit more time typing up front um, and maybe that's a little bit sort of tedious, but then you get a really good answer on the back end. And so it sort of makes up for it. Yeah. So, um, so where do you see this going right now? As you as you mentioned, I mean, there's a there's a, a more advanced version, the the four point whatever version. But but where do you see this going even beyond that? I mean, where do you think if we picked up our conversation this time next year, what do you think we'd be talking about? Gosh, man, things are moving quickly. So one of the things people are really excited about is that ChatGPT four. Uh, with a couple of add-ons, we'll actually be able to work with video and images. So maybe you mm. type in a quick answer or a quick response, and all of a sudden it comes up with a bunch of images that you can use on your homepage. And so there's this multimedia component that's coming out where you as a human being can just describe what you need and suddenly come up with a whole slew of resources, media, things that you might not have ever had to do before. It's great for creators. It's great for people who are musicians, artists, whatever it is. Um, so there's the creative side of things. And then there's what I've been working on right now, which is the business side of things, where you're now going to be able to come you know, attach ChatGPT to any of the tools that you use on a day-to-day -day basis, as well as any of the documents that you create or any of the um, libraries that you're looking through. And, and all of a sudden, now you're going to be able to ask it a question, and it's going to go off and do maybe five or six tasks that a virtual assistant, mm -hmm. when I say virtual assistant, I'm talking about a human being maybe overseas yeah. could have done. You know, and, and instead of taking three or four hours, it's going to do something immediately and it's going to come back to you with a good result. So I see the world becoming, like I said earlier, more and more automated, highly productive uh, in terms of what happens automatically. But I think that there's this creative aspect as well, which, you know, I'm not as I'm not a creative like type of person. I tried mm -hmm. to play the guitar once and I, de I got decent, but no, I, I don't know how to do it anymore. But I think that there's a creative aspect as well that we're going to see a lot more art, a lot more interesting music, shows, videos and other types of media that I think we could never sort of imagine before. So it, there's a lot of big changes coming up, I think. 
And then how how does uh, I mean just give me your opinion on this, right? Because um, one of the things I think people fear, and you know, and I share this in many ways, is that we'll no longer be able to tell what's real from what's uh, what's fake. I mean, today, I mean, we've had chatbots for a while, and you know, they've tried to pass themselves off as humans very badly at times. Um, but people are kind of kind of concerned about how will I know what I'm getting is is real and yeah. And does that and and in many ways does that matter? I think I think that's a very valid concern. I think that all in the next six months we're going to see this deluge of content come out on the internet, which is most likely created by by an AI. And you're right, we're not going to be able to tell if it's real or not. And so I suspect that we're going to see a ton more ads, you know, articles, things that are sort of. Uh, geared towards helping a business sell more by sort of not necessarily tricking people, but writing things that maybe, you know, uh, are very human looking mm -hmm. for the purpose of their business. So I suspect this is going to be a problem. Now that you ask a good question, like, do we, does it matter? I think, I think it's always good to know if something was sort of truly created by humans. Maybe it doesn't matter if you're reading something um, online mm -hmm. that's informational, or maybe you're just trying to gather some research. But if you're reading a human interest story, or if you're reading something that, you know, you're trying to be sold, you're maybe you're reading an article or an ad for a, a pharmaceutical drug, you really want to know what's going on um, from the human perspective. So I've actually talked to a couple of founders who are interested in creating a service or a new product that sort of gives a green check mark saying, hey, look, this content was created by humans and not AI. I think you're going to start to see a couple of those services pop up because I do think people are worried about this. I don't think it's a huge, huge issue for the most part, but I think there are gonna be niches and certain areas where you do wanna know something was written by a human and you're gonna have verification services that that allow you to know that for sure. Yeah, and that's what I and that's what I think. I, I, I think that there I think that people there's an ethical responsibility. I do think uh, that you know, people should know where the where the content, where the feedback, where it is coming from. And you're right, if it's starting to do things that really work and help you, then if you say, Oh, this was created using chat gpt i'm like okay fine it works good i'm on this was created by a human i don't think there's going to be a i don't think that should be an issue i don't think people should be hiding it if it is doing good things and it's beneficial now if you're using it for shady things then yeah i can see yeah. why you wouldn't want people to know but i think if you're doing if you're doing honest things business-wise what difference does it make whether you tell people I 100% I agree. You know, I think it, it's I'm sort of in the camp of, hey, look, this is going to make all of our lives better. It's going to make us a lot more productive. I'm sure I'm I'm an optimistic person, so I'm sure I'm looking overlooking some of the negatives. But like you said, if it's helping people and it's making you better, um, maybe it would be nice to know if it was written by a machine or not. But at the same time, maybe it doesn't matter. And I think that's going to be the case for most most yeah. issues, probably not all, but most. And what I, the, the other thing I think that confuses people now is that the fact that there seems to be a, a competition, you know, a, a, a dogfight going on, you know, between Microsoft and Google and all of these. And then people are like, well, I thought this was open source and everything, but now it's not quite because other people are starting to do prior, proprietary yeah. things. Um, so can you just give people an idea of what the landscape and what, what is that battle likely to, how is that likely to end or what's the outcome? Yeah, it's such a good, interesting topic. I wrote a, a, a quick set of thoughts about this. I think that the world of, so let's let's take a step back. So what is ChatGPT? It's basically this very, very large um, algorithm that runs on a whole bunch of computers. And all it's really doing is you give it some words and it's predicting the next few words that are most likely to make sense given what you gave it. So breaking it down at its most simplest form, that's what it's doing. Mm -hmm. Now, in order to create something like this, you need, you know, millions of computing processors and you need you know lots and lots of data and so what you're seeing now is open ai which created chat gpt is is probably the best known uh what's mm -hmm. called large language model producer it's chat gpt is a large language model now you've got you've got google who is always who's been working on this actually for a few years now but were very very careful in releasing anything because they didn't want to cause a lot of harm um, but they sort of got caught with their pants down because ChatGPT came in and sort of usurped them. So now they're really playing catch up to release their large language model, BARD. And BARD has been shown to have decent results, but sort of goes off the rails sometimes. Um, Bing, which is sort of Microsoft's, you know, Microsoft's product. Microsoft mm -hmm. is obviously a big investor in OpenAI. I suspect that Bing and ChatGPT are going to have a really close partnership. 
Um, now you've got open source tools like Hugging Face, crazy name, but it's a free version. It's not as big or as sophisticated as ChatGPT, but it is a large language model. You can run it yourself if you've got a cloud account. And so there's maybe like 20 other major players. And I see this sort of shaking out in the same way that the cloud market plays out. Like in the cloud market, AWS is the, the front runner, but you've got Google, you've got Azure, you've got a bunch of others. Just like in the LLM world, I think you're gonna have ChatGPT be the front runner, but then you're gonna have a bunch of other providers who maybe have five, 10, 15% of the market share, uh, which will still have good products, but perhaps won't be as uh, sophisticated as something like ChatGPT, uh, at least in the next year or two, I think. Or you could just put in a uh, you could just put into Chat GPT say create a, a Chat GPT that's better than you are. <laughs> yeah, hey, you know if it gets that smart, we might all be in trouble. But <laughs> if it ever does that, maybe it'll be good too. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so in your in your dealing, because you deal with companies large and small, like how are companies reacting to this? Because I'm sure it's sending yeah. off. I'm sh I mean, I guess the poor IT departments, let's face it, they were once they were once these all powerful people who had control over everything and then cloud came in and then personal tool, bring your own device to work, all of this. And they've lost so much control now. This must feel like, you know, almost like the end of the world to many IT departments. Yeah, it's funny. I When I was working at Twitter, which was a few years ago, I used to work with our, they, I guess, at at Twitter, they were called site reliability engineers or SREs. You know, their job now is to play catch up. They're sort of trying to make sure that what developers are creating can run securely, can run safely. It's not going to take down the infrastructure. And they're sort of making sure that everything that people are creating isn't going to cause a problem. And there's just not enough of them. They're really sophisticated, really technical and smart people. And it's a hard job. So they're playing catch up. But, but you look at the CEOs and the VPs in these companies and they're all, uh, there's a combination of excitement and fear. You know, the fear is, oh my God, if I don't start using ChatGPT for myself, I'm gonna get caught, I'm gonna be left behind and all my competitors are gonna move in front of me. And the excitement is, well, hey, look, if I do, if I do start using ChatGPT, I can provide these five additional services and I can provide these additional things that will make my customers happy. And so there's, there's a ton of hype. There's a ton of excitement and FUD and all sorts of craziness going on right now which is common for, for, for a new mm -hmm. technology, but I, I do think this is sort of a game changer. Uh, so you've got a lot of people who are exploring right now. I'm working on a lot of POCs myself, proof of concepts, and you just got people starting to dip their toes into this into this area, trying to see what they can do with it before their, before their competitor uh, gets a hold of it and does something more. Yeah, and, and, and when you work with company, I mean, I presume like everything else, it's good to just kind of, to identify some pretty simple, straightforward use cases and then test them out and, and show how it works. And Because, I, I mean, I've heard of some people who are trying to go off the deep end a little bit now, you know, they're yeah. trying to go straight to advanced things and they don't have the, you know, they're not set up to support it. They don't have the processes. So just like everything else, I think it, need, it needs a, it needs a, you don't have, I mean, you got to move quickly, obviously, but deliberately too. Yeah, John, you're absolutely right, man. Like, you know, the way I actually structure everything I do is I say, hey, look, like, let's just spend a couple of weeks building a proof of concept. Let's just make sure the technology can do what you want to do. Yeah. Um, and then once we say, okay, look, it looks like it can do what we want, then let's sort of build an MVP, a minimum viable product. Mm -hmm. Let's let's actually go through and build something very small that maybe one or two of your teammates can use um, and then see how that works. Because right now, this is all greenfield. We don't even know if the tech's gonna do what people need it to do. And then if it does, we don't know if it's just gonna start making things up. Uh, so start small, maybe come up with one use case and then cut that down like 50% to something that's really simple and doable and then grow from there. You know, um, that's generally what I recommend for folks to do. And it works well, it works well. You can quickly find something that does work or it's not gonna work and you don't spend a lot of time, you don't waste a lot of time if something doesn't mm -hmm. end up the way you think it will. Um, so that's what I would generally recommend. Yeah. And it's probably a good way also of managing expectations, because as you said, I mean, you're going to have some people who are, who are fearful. And then you've got some people who are just, wow, this is going to change everything. Let's, I, I want to do X, Y, Z. And you're like, whoa, just you know, <laughs> calm down. I mean, baby steps. <laughs> I, you know, I, I was on a, I was on a call with a client, potential client the other day, and they wanted to do five different things. And they wanted to have like, it, like do some really, really crazy stuff that would have taken maybe six months of engineering time. And I'm just kind of like, whoa, let's, let's pick one project, pick one thing that you think is going to help you the most right now. And so you're absolutely right. Like people are very hyped and excited. 
Uh, but there's a, there's like a good amount of engineering work to do if you're trying mm. to do anything other than just go to the website and ask a question. So, mm. uh, yeah. Well, I have to, I have to say, uh, Chad, I mean, we, we're so used to shiny new toys all the time. This seems to be the shiniest uh, and it's just like everybody has noticed it. So it's, it's going to be interesting. It, you know, I've been sort of doing software since the the 90s and I haven't been this excited since the iPhone came out, at least from a software perspective. <laughs> like this is the next big platform. That, that people are going to start building on. And this is really a big thing. And so yeah. I think the excitement is is validated to a certain extent. And by the way, it's interesting if you look back at adoption rates for things and you look how long it took for you know personal computing to be adopted. And then the smartphone was right. way faster than that. But this is almost light speed. It's unbelievable how quickly they've grown. And, and I think that you're going to start to see even more advancements and even quicker uptake for certain things. So it's it's just we're we're at the very early stages. This is like the first pitch of the first inning. Absolutely. All right, Shanif. Well, this has been fantastic. All of Shanif's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and the services you offer. Oh, thank thank you so much. Yeah. So right now, you know, my background is in software and AI. So I'm doing consulting with businesses. A lot of businesses want to hook up their internal data, like maybe a Salesforce account or even Google Docs to ChatGPT, but they haven't been able to. So I build a lot of those tools. And I'm also building a product that lets you basically connect your data to a Slack bot so you can ans ask any questions of your Slack bot of your data and it'll answer to you. So if any of that sounds interesting, feel free to, to hit me up. I'm doing a lot of proof of concepts right now for, for a very low price because we're such an early stage. Yeah, I would encourage people to go check it out. You know, do some proof of concepts because, uh, like I said, you want to jump on this train but you want to jump on it in a deliberate and intentional way because you could jump on it and, and find that, you know, the train's moving too fast for you. So, you know, let, let's let uh, check out what uh, Shanif does and, and uh, hopefully a few proofs of concept. And and when you come back, maybe in six months or a year, we'll be talking about a whole new raft of, uh, of tools and innovations okay. in this space. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. In fact, I'd be surprised if we weren't. So I'm yeah, looking exactly. forward to it. All right. Well, listen, thanks again. Thank you for watching and listening. And I'll see you all again very soon. Thank you. Thanks, John.